and thank you for being here. The first Aquafix webinar of the year will be presented today by Aquafix microbiologist Deborah Lee, and she will be talking with us about ammonia removal and nitrification. So I will pass it on to Deborah. Thank you, John, and thank you everyone for being here today. Um, my name is Deborah, and today's topic is ammonia removal and nitrification. A bit of background on Aquafix. We're a biological lab located in the University of Wisconsin's Research Park in Madison, Wisconsin. We make bacteria, enzyme, and biostimulant formulations for wastewater treatment. On the bottom left here, you'll see me and Dan, our chemist. We're responsible for culturing bacteria and enzymes and creating the formulations that go into our products. This is also where we process samples from wastewater operators from across the country. These samples help us solve the challenges that come with treating wastewater. This is the nitrogen cycle, and it's important to understand that the nitrogen and ammonia that you reduce in wastewater treatment is part of this larger cycle. The most commonly thought of input of nitrogen is the biological nitrogen in plants, and animals and waste and soil runoff. Uh, there's also nitrogen in groundwater since nitrate, unlike ammonia, is not bound to soil or clay particles and moves through the soil into the groundwater and then seeps out into the lakes, ponds, streams, or your wastewater plant. So if your plant has a lot of input from infiltration um, in an ar agricultural area, you may deal with high nitrate coming into your plant. There's also nitrogen gas in the atmosphere. Um, it can enter the waterways or soils uh, through bacteria that have to convert this nitrogen gas into a more usable form of ammonia, usually in the form of the amino acid glutamate. This process is called nitrogen fixation. The bacteria um, that, does, that do this conversion can be part of the plant rhizomes inside your plant area or cyanobacteria in the pond, or they might just be individual free floating cells in your wastewater plant. Biological treatment is used to pre prevent most of this nitrogen and other compounds from ending up in the environment and leading to undesirable outcomes such as algal blooms in lakes and ponds. Um, these algal blooms can cause fish death through lack of oxygen or through direct toxin production. Uh, this treatment also prevents the prevalence of nitrate or nitrite in drinking water wells. Many of the oxic and anoxic pathways in this picture are also occurring in wastewater. Nitrogen takes several forms in wastewater, and we'll just go through all the terms so that everyone's on the same page, and then we'll look at some of these a little bit more closely. Organic nitrogen is the nitrogen that's bound in BOD. Um, ammonia nitrogen is kind of a shorthand term that incorporates both the ammonium ion, NH4+, as well as ammonia, which is uncharged, NH3. Nitrite and nitrogen trait are two oxidized products of ammonia nitrogen. When nitrification occurs, ammonia is oxidized to <clears throat> all the way down to nitrate, which is denitrified um, through anaerobic processes all the way back to nitrogen gas, which then gets released into the atmosphere. TKN, or the total kiljol nitrogen, is one common measurement that's used in a lot of wastewater plants, and that's the sum of the total organic nitrogen you have that can be decomposed, uh, plus your uh, free ammonia or ammonium nitrogen. Uh, we've got a few molecules here at the bottom. Starting first at the left, we're looking at the ammonium ion. If you take away one of these white balls, you, you have ammonia. Um, the next one here is nitrite. And then at the far end here, we have nitrate. These three forms are what make up the inorganic nitrogen in wastewater. Getting started, we'll look at what organic nitrogen is. 
and it mostly comes in through the influent in three forms in the form of proteins which are these uh, long structures they may be three-dimensional free amino acids and urea uh, proteins again are these long chains of amino acids and if you look at the protein molecule in the center of the screen here it gets broken down and you can see the, what the individual amino acid looks like um, you see that there's the amino group here which is where the nitrogen is held as these organic nitrogen compounds are being converted in the wastewater treatment process the nitrogen that's bound up in the proteins mostly gets released and becomes part of the nitrification process. There's some small amount of the organic nitrogen that will never be released, mostly because your proteins will be in a more complex three-dimensional structure that cannot be broken down or cannot be broken down within your treatment time frame. And that actually just passes straight through the plant and may be treated downstream. Um, proteins in meat processing or cheese or dairy uh, may make up a large amount of nitrogen entering a wastewater system. The biggest nitrogen contributor to municipal influence is in the form of urea. Uh, so this urea molecule here at the bottom, um, it has to be broken down into the free ammonia using an enzyme called urease. And that helps cleave these bonds, and then you end up with your free ammonia. Uh, ammonia is where the nitrification process begins. For plants that are not nitrifying well, they don't process through these sequences, uh, and the, mon the ammonia nitrogen just ends up kind of remaining and doesn't end up converted. So as we go through these two processes, um, you'll see that the ammonia on the left here requires some oxygen and then gets converted into nitrite with a little bit of acid generation. The nitrite then gets converted using oxygen again into nitrate. Uh, nitrification is a biological process and it takes place with the help of bacteria and the enzymes those bacteria create. The oxidation of ammonia to nitrite was thought to be primarily done through nitrosomonas and nitrospera. We've got an image here of nitrosomonas. Uh, this picture was taken using an electron microscope. You can't identify these bacteria using a regular light microscope because they are too small. We also have some ammonia that will be removed by heterotrophic nitrifiers. The next step in the process, the conversion of nitrite to nitrate, we have, uh, we primarily thought this was done through nitrobacter. And that is still maybe true, but um, nitrifying bacteria are becoming increasingly better characterized. And there is increasing evidence that nitrosomonas and nitrobacter are not the primary nitrifiers in wastewater activated sludge. Uh, different nitrifying bacteria tend to specialize to different conditions, so different wastewater plants tend to have very different populations of these nitrifying bacteria. Nitrifiers use um, an oxidation process to generate energy. So here you're taking in your oxygen, uh, converting everything down there, and you generate a really low amount of energy. Um, this is not anywhere near the amount of energy that's generated from heterotrophs, which get their energy from oxidizing glucose. Uh, because ammonia and nitrite oxidizers are autotrophs, they actually need to use an inorganic form of carbon from the environment uh, to make their own carbon source. And they can then use it as heterotrophs do, but they really are not using very much, um, getting much energy out of this. Uh, this is sort of similar to how plants and algae function. So nitrifiers have a lot more steps involved in their metabolism. They end up using a lot more energy and the net energy they gained is much lower than for heterotrophs, such as your flock formers. So the heterotrophs, the flock-forming bacteria, um, 
These are the bacteria that you primarily see and make up the bulk of your mixed liquor suspended solids. They're using um, high energy organic molecules. So when they're broken down, they get a lot of energy generated. Um, they use organic carbon as well for their carbon and uh, it doesn't take them as much energy to incorporate it into their cell biomass. So they put a lot less energy in and they get a lot more energy out. And the flop forming bacteria are able to build up their populations much more quickly than the nitrifying bacteria. So the microorganisms are the bacteria we just discussed. Um, if you follow the pathways, oh, whoops. If you look here on the left, um, at the top left, uh, you can see kind of how that energy gained or not really gained is translated into cell biomass. And what we see here is uh, the heterotrophs that gain a lot of energy for in a short amount of time, they end up with a very high population of cell biomass versus the nitrifiers, which don't really generate a lot of energy and they take a long, long time to generate any amount of biomass. So generally the doubling time for heterotrophs is anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes, whereas the doubling time for nitrifiers is about 22 to 48 hours. So the rates that um, nitrifiers grow is warmer and in warm water and it tends to be slower in cold water. Now this is also true for heterotrophs, however, um, Heterotrophs can, since they already start off at a high population, they can handle those temperature chains a lot better than the nitrifiers, which start off at a low population and can't really handle that sort of temperature change effectively. Um, in the activated biomass in a treatment plant, you can estimate that about 10% of that biomass is going to be made up of nitrifying bacteria. And the way that they typically end up in the wastewater plant is coming in from the environment. Um, like I mentioned, all those nitrification processes go on outside the wastewater plant as well. So nitrifying bacteria can exist in the soil and in the waterways. And some amount of these are going to be coming in from environmental inputs. In many studies of wastewater, nitrifying bacteria are reported to comprise about 0.39% to 9% of the bacteria in activated sludge. In most cases, wastewater treatment systems have about 4 to 6% of their bacterial population made up of nitrifying bacteria. So again, it's, it's a very low population um, in general. And since they have a low population, they are much more susceptible to changes that may occur. Uh, th this is our sludge age diagram, and it's to kind of help you get a perspective on what may, going, what may be going on with your activated sludge and how that relates to nitrification. Um, so very important, you do need to have healthy flock formers and good BOD removal before nitrification can occur. So generally you want to be somewhere within this range. Um, healthy flocks mean your sludge age is not too old or too young, which won't form flocks, or too old, in which case you'll have large dense flocks that are starting to break apart. Um, nitrification really doesn't work too well at either end of the sludge age. Uh, so it, again, if your sludge age is too young, um, you're going to have more BOD than your bacteria can remove in a good, a good time frame. And this means your nitrifiers won't get enough oxygen to be able to nitrify. The flock formers use up all of the oxygen as fast as they can. So the flock, if the flock formers don't use up your BOD fast enough, uh, you also won't get good settling. Uh, you won't have clear effluent. And in some cases, you might not even get flock formation. You'd be maybe right around here. On the other hand, if your sludge age looks too old, uh, you may see poor BOD removal or the disintegration and breakup of your flock as the bacteria inside it begin to starve and die. You may also have flock breakup due to the growth of filamentous bacteria. If your sludge age uh, stays too old for too long a time, you may even get form from 
foam formation. Um, this could occur because of the fine particles and dead microbes beginning to float on the surface of your aeration basin. Um, these particles can stabilize the air bubbles as they're coming up, and that might lead to some foaming. Oat sludge also seems to favor the growth of nocardiforms, and these are branch filamentous bacteria, and they look like little tumbleweeds under the microscope. These filaments also like to float on the surface, and nocardiforms can lead to large foaming events that really upset your entire operation. Um, persistent heavy foam and thick scum will also reduce the amount of oxygen diffusing in from the surface of the basin into the rest of the water. And this can be a significant reduction in oxygen for your mixed liquor, and that would also lead to a lower nitrification. Okay, so here's some examples of how flock form. So starting with this first image, uh, we have an example of very young sludge. As you can see, there's hardly any flock in here, and this is all mostly free bacteria. Um, this, we're pretty sure, is mostly just heterotrophs having fun, surviving, starting to use up everything. And they're happily swimming around instead of forming good settling flocks. Um, this indicates that there's still a little too much BOD for the current amount of active bacteria to use in the aeration basin. And the heterotrophs are using pretty much all the oxygen and maybe a little bit of nitrogen. Um, that, that leaves very little time for ammonia removal through nitrification um, within this particular hydraulic retention time. So this next picture here is a picture of mostly healthy flock. Um, in this case, there's good flock formation and relatively low amounts of free bacteria. Um, this means that the bacteria hit the phase where they're using up the incoming BOD relatively fast, and the nitrifiers have some time and enough oxygen to oxidize the leftover ammonia. Um, oops. All right. I guess that was for the last picture, actually. That's good flock. So here in the middle, we were just starting to get some flock formation. You may not have really efficient nitrification at this point, but you should be seeing lower, lowering levels of nitrate or of ammonia in your effluent. And then by the time you have nice settling flock, um, you should have good nitrification. Uh, for the nitrifiers in a wastewater process, uh, to be happy and healthy, they do have some requirements. And this is what we call the nitrification wheel. And we're going to look at a lot of these components individually. The first topic uh, will be when nitrifiers themselves get knocked out of the plant or killed off for some reason. For most wastewater treatment plants, when they have an issue with nitrification, it can fall into one of two categories. There's the acute issue where the plant has historically nitrified pretty well and something's happened and their nitrifiers were lost or otherwise unfunctioning. Uh, that's compared with a plant that has more of a chronic issue where they were never able to nitrify very well and that's usually because of one or multiple factors in this nitrification wheel that were not being met. Um, so this first slide here, we're going to look <coughs> at what's commonly, the most common of the acute issues where the nitrifying bacteria are simply lost for some reason. Um, one major reason that they can be lost is high flow rates. So if a rainfall event leads to higher than average flows, the plant can get washed out and lose their bacteria and nitrifiers don't grow that fast. Um, the other common acute cause here is uh, toxicity that's causing a loss of nitrifiers. So systems that are fed mostly by a food processor or an industry where they need to use a lot of cleaning products, it's common for these plants to be using some sort of sanitizer. Uh, we broadly call them biocides. Uh, parasitic acid is one example and one that's been really big lately. Uh, is quaternary ammonia compounds, or quaternary amines, or quats for short. So quats and those other biocides are designed to kill bacteria indiscriminately. 
when they're sprayed on the surface, um, ultimately they end up getting washed down the floor drain and eventually into the wastewater plant. For systems where you have a lot of dilution with other processes um, and other types of influent, these biocides get diluted out and they're probably not a problem. However, if there's a large dump or um, a processor that uses a lot of biocides makes up a large percentage of your influent, then this can quickly become a problem. These issues are generally compounded when it happens during the winter, um, where if you get a slug load of biocide or heavy rainfall event and a washout, the nitrifiers will be much slower to repopulate the plant in winter, and they can just end up taking too long to get back up to get your nitrification levels back up to where they need to be. Um, the usually big controllable factor that people run into trouble with uh, with their nitrifiers is dissolved oxygen. Nitrifying bacteria are aerobic microorganisms and they do require oxygen to respire and perform their metabolism. So generally two to four parts per million of oxygen is considered ideal. For plants that have low oxygen, um, it's less common for it to be an issue with the plant design and more commonly it's just poorly functioning aerators. Um, many plants will regulate their aeration basins using a DO probe and that's great, but sometimes the probes break or they have other issues and you may end up with a false reading of adequate dissolved oxygen. The other big way that we see dissolved oxygen being an issue is when there's been a short-term drop in oxygen, and that could be related to a slug load of high-strength incoming BOD. Um, that's when the heterotrophic bacteria will just go crazy and use all of that and all the BOD and use all of the oxygen, and then your oxygen might end up dropping down to zero. Um, so if that sort of low DO condition persists for 24 hours or more, um, it can definitely knock out most of your population of nitrifying bacteria, uh, and especially if you're wasting heavily during that time. Some plants are able to do well at lower than two to four parts per million, um, but that's not always the case in the aerobic system. Those conditions might have been averaged overall uh, for say systems that are using denitrification or enhanced biological phosphorus removal where you do need that lower DO level initially but generally that then goes into an aerobic system and it's still ideal to have two to four ppm of dissolved oxygen for your aerobic basin. So this picture here on the left is an example of what good DO looks like um, in wastewater flocks. We look at these flocks under phase contrast using the 40x objectives. So this comes out to 400x magnification. You do not need a stain for it, but you do need to have phase contrast capability. The picture on the right over here is an example of what low DO looks like in flocks. Um, when we see samples that look like this one, we may ask if there have been issues regarding aeration. So we're seeing quite a lot of dark areas compared to the normal light tan or yellowish sort of color that we normally see. Um, so some issues with aeration is maybe the aerators got shut down due to a power failure or for some other reason. Um, it is possible that there may be no good way for a plant to monitor aeration in their basins and adjust it quickly. Uh, that's unfortunate and Low DO can lead to anaerobic bacterial metabolism, generally within these darker areas. Uh, that doesn't use as much nitrogen or phosphorus uh, per carbon substrate as aerobic metabolism does. So you can get nitrogen as ammonia actually released into the water under these conditions, resulting in, uh, in higher effluent ammonia. Anaerobic metabolism can also produce compounds that bind strongly to oxygen, such as hydrogen sulfide gas. And this metabolism also releases a lot of simple carbon compounds, which the heterotrophs will then use or use with oxygen, and that makes less oxygen available to the nitrifiers. 
Incomplete denitrification, which is also an anaerobic metabolism, um, can also produce nitrite, which may inhibit some ammonia oxidizers and make the nitrite oxidizers require more oxygen um, to oxidize us back to nitrate. Uh, that situation may also cause some rising sludge. Okay, so now we're going to talk about alkalinity. Another important factor is the amount of carbonate alkalinity you have in your plant. Um, since the nitrifiers are autotrophs, they do prefer to use carbonate alkalinity as their preferred carbon source to use in their biomass production. Um, in contrast, heterotrophic flock formers um, use organic carbon sources as their carbon source. And that's what they use for their cellu cellular components and it just all goes a lot faster and easier. So something to point out here, carbonate alkalinity is not the same thing as hardness. Hardness refers to the level of divalent cations such as magnesium, calcium, iron, or manganese. Those are the common ones available in water. Um, this gets confusing because both hardness and alkalinity are reported in terms of parts per million of calcium carbonate. Alkalinity measures the buffering capacity of your water. It's the amount of hydroxides and carbonates in the water that can be used to neutralize acids. Um, this is also not the same as pH. Uh, pH just measures the acidity or basicness of your water. Um, alkalinity is essential for the autotrophic nitrifiers um, since the carbonates and bicarbonates are their primary carbon source. Um, However, all of the alkalinity, including the hydroxides, helps to neutralize acid production, which is in that first step where ammonia is oxidized to nitrite. It generates um, some acid. So nitrifiers typically need four to seven parts per million, per million of carbonate um, per one part per million of ammonia that's entering the treatment plant. Uh, to put that into terms, uh, as an example, we can say that a standard municipal wastewater plant um, may get 30 parts per million of incoming ammonia, and it will take um, 120 to 210 parts per million of alkalinity to neutralize the acid being generated from that ammonia. Uh, the EPA puts out a good map, which I've pictured here, showing the carbonate alkalinity of surface waters um, all over the US except Hawaii. Um, so in some areas, you normally have a naturally low amount of carbonate al alkalinity, and uh, those areas may suffer a little bit from poor alkalinity and poor nitrification. Not all the plants within those areas will end up with alkalinity deficiencies, because as various types of suspended solids are being added to the wastewater, a lot of alkalinity ends up coming into the wastewater plant with that. If you do run into a case of low alkalinity, um, some common additives would be soda, ash, or lime. Lime has a variety of issues, mostly that it's not very soluble, and that makes it pretty difficult to use. Um, when it, and when it is solubilized well and used at a high rate, it's also very common to have scaling issues in pumps and and lines, and that can cause a lot of operational issues. So to help with low alkalinity, or if you're just seeing swings in your pH, uh, which, may which may indicate that you do have low alkalinity, uh, we recommend adding Boost and Lock. This product also helps instances of just general low pH. Um, Boost and Lock is a blend of magnesium hydroxide, hydrated lime, sodium bicarbonate, and sodium carbonate. This, the combination of these ingredients provides superior pH stabilization when compared to either ingredient alone. Um, it's nice because you really won't overshoot a pH of 9. So the next stop on the nitrification wheel that we'll look at is pH. And this measures the level of acidity or basicness in your treatment plant. So pH is important for a couple of reasons. 
Um, nitrifying bacteria are generally working best at a pH range of 6.2 to 7.9. Um, the closer they are around to about 7.2, the happier and more healthy they're going to be. Um, ammonia oxidation produces acids, so too much acids from ammonia oxidation can actually drop your pH down to about pH 5.5, at which point the um, ammonia oxidizing bacteria will be inhibited and they won't nitrify anymore. Conversely, ammonia oxidizing bacteria will either be dormant or they might die at a pH of greater than 8.5. So beyond that, when you start hitting this range, um, your nitrifiers are more than likely dying off. And also your ammonium, which is soluble in water, will begin to, will begin to convert into ammonia, which is volatile. So right around pH 9.5, pretty much all of your ammonium has, volatile, has become ammonia and that could be volatilizing off. So it'll smell kind of like a kitty litter box. So at very high levels of either ammonia, the ion or ammonia, um, it's going to be toxic to even the nitrifying bacteria. Um, but how, Ammonia at lower levels is toxic, and that still really depends on what your pH level is. Um, so when a plant gets a high pH um, and they get above 8.5, there starts to be some real large inhibitory effects um, just from the ammonia. Um, and most plants, except in industrial applications, will typically not have to deal with this high pH since it's more common for wastewater treatment plants to be right around seven. Um, municipal plants that, that do tend to struggle with pH, they generally end up more with, with more problems on the low end. Um, so there's a couple of ways that, that operators for plants with low pH can deal with that. Um, usually they add some kind of base to bring the pH up. Uh, again, examples would be caustic soda. It's a very high pH and it's actually fairly easy to overshoot the pH and this causes the issues on the other end. Um, that's, it's also uh, pretty, pretty bad if you get caustic soda on top of you, so it's not very convenient to handle. Another good option that operators tend to use is magnesium hydroxide. Uh, this does a good job to quickly increase the pH and you should not be going above pH nine. You could also add boost and lock to help increase and stabilize the pH. It's generally what we recommend is use sodium hydroxide or magnesium hydroxide if you're below a pH of six, whichever one's more convenient for you to acquire and handle. So it, add that in, add either one in until you hit a pH of around six and then switch to boost and lock to go from pH six to seven and that should help hold you steady at pH seven. So at this point, we've touched on dissolved oxygen, carbonate, alkalinity, and pH. Um, and we've talked about what happens when nitrifiers are lost through a washout or some form of toxicity. For plants that have an acute event and the carbonate, DO, and pH are all in a good range, it's usually pretty simple to get nitrification back simply by adding additional nitrifying bacteria. For plants that have con chronic issues, uh, we like to work with them and help figure out what's going on there. Is there anything we can adjust here that help that might help you um, get up to good nitrification levels? Uh, so now we'll talk about temperature. Um, as we know, rapid temperature changes, they happen and there's not much you can do about it and they have a significant adverse effects on nitrification since nitrifiers with their very low populations are unable to adjust quickly um, due to their slow growth rate as well. Most bacteria in municipal wastewater, including nitrifiers, uh, generally have slower metabolism and slower growth rates as the temperatures decrease. Um, nitrifiers prefer a temperature range between 15 to 30 degrees Celsius, that comes out to 59 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, they, 
Nectrifiers generally have a really hard time growing even to maintain the populations at this lower temperatures, 15 Celsius or 59 Fahrenheit. Um, and sometimes at these higher temperatures, uh, it's not so much that they're growing slowly, it's that they're having a really hard time acquiring oxygen. So the amounts of dissolved oxygen that you can get into your water at a higher temperature is much less than what you can get in there at a lower temperature. Um, although some populations may be adjusted to these lower or higher temperatures, uh, generally to quickly increase the population of nitrifiers in this situation, additional nitrifiers need to be added. So the Vitastim dynamic duel is what we use to reseed nitrifying bacteria when we know they're going to thrive. Um, and it's simply a matter of having too low population for some reason. So all of these are generally fine. Maybe the temperature just went up and down. So part one is our Vitastim nitrifiers. Um, they are the ones that do the ammonia oxidation and nitride oxidation pathway. Um, the other part is the part that has heterotrophic ammonia assimilators. These are bacteria that take up nitrogen and they incorporate it directly into their cellular structure. Uh, it's just another way of lowering ammonia in a treatment plant and it also works at a low DO, which is pretty handy for some systems. Uh, these are two ways of getting the ammonia brought down. To use Dynamic Dual, typically the products are added at the same time, so you can use both parts simultaneously. They're both added directly to the aeration basin, and they establish themselves very quickly, so operators can get a very quick drop in ammonia. Um, it's typical for us to do a 10-day treatment. Um, after those 10 days, not only has the ammonia dropped, but the nitrifiers should be well established within the plant and able to reproduce within that plant's hydraulic retention time. Uh, so there's no, there should be no continued need to keep adding these products. Uh, we culture these bacteria in our lab through batch culturing methods. Um, we start with some seed bacteria and we grow them in tanks. We add the right cofactors to build their populations up. And when it's time to bottle them, we add some micronutrients. Uh, those micronutrients help the bacteria establish quickly when, once they get into the wastewater system. Um, the packaged product is safe for about six months. The only requirement is they need to be refrigerated to extend that shelf life. Um, beyond six months, there's some slow drop off in the active concentration of bacteria, but we've had plenty of operators that had them in the refrigerator for a year and then used them after a year and still had great results. One other thing I'll mention is that when we're culturing these bacteria, we're doing it with two big things in mind that are specific to wastewater. One is we want them to be well adapted to a high BOD environment or high strength wastewater. Um, the nitrifying bacteria that you might see in, in aquarium fish stores, um, they're really not suited for high BOD environments. And when you add them to a wastewater plant, they pretty much die right away. And the second factor we focus on when we're culturing them is we want them to be adapted to the cold. So a lot of times operators are having their biggest issues with nitrification during the winter. So we want our bacteria and our nitrifiers to be well suited, uh, to be active and established quickly in these colder environments. So here we've got some charts that will give you an idea of how we dose this product. The dose rate is based on two main factors, um, the influent flow rate, how quickly water is moving through the plant, and what the temperature is at. Uh, the warmer the temperature, the less products are required, and as you move towards the colder temperatures, more product is required. Um, let's say for an average, whoops, Let's say for an average one million gallon per day plant um, that doesn't have high influent ammonia, something like less than 40 parts per million, um, with a water temperature of 60 to 70 
2 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, we'd be looking at adding about a gallon per day of each product, um, the nitrifiers and the assimilators, uh, for about four days. Uh, then we cut that dose back and do an additional maintenance of six days. And almost every time we do this, uh, we'll be able to get the ammonia to drop down to where it needs to be. So municipal plants, uh, they should see a effluent ammonia decreasing within three days. If not, we'd like to hear from you so we can explore what may be going on. For plants treating industrial wastewater, that has a lot more variables to consider, and we also need to consider what sort of production is going on and the cleaning schedules. Um, I would give it about seven days to see some effect. If you don't see the ammonia starting to decrease in this time, or if it goes up, we, we want to hear from you. Uh, we would then need to get a bit more details about what might be going in, on in the plant and some of the operations. and Hopefully, by, with all that, we can try and make a better plan to get the ammonia down. Uh, sometimes you may have problems with nitrification, even with healthy looking flock and good settling. Um, it's not often that this occurs, but sometimes you have mixed liquor that's just on the edge between healthy and old sludge. And the longer the system oscillates between um, sort of healthy and old sludge, the more the system ends up looking and behaving like old sludge with some of the flocks starting to break apart, particles, very large condensed uh, centers that don't take up oxygen very well. So just to review, um, very young sludge age tends to have high soluble BOD and this means the heterotrophic bacteria are using nearly all the oxygen and the nitrifiers can't function. And with old sludge age, the flock may break up or you might have bulking issues or foaming issues due to filament growth. And these bulking and foaming issues might cause oxygen limitation or poor BOD removal, as well as high TSS. So in some cases, you may have effluent ammonia levels that are higher than your influent ammonia levels. Uh, this may actually be due to nitrogen limitation within the plant because if the heterotrophic flock formers don't have enough nitrogen for them to maintain their metabolism and cell structure, they begin to die. And when they die, they release a lot more ammonia. So this might also be accompanied by some scum formation or maybe some sliming or bulking. Okay, so nitrogen deficient sliming is generally found with influence with high carbon BOD, um, but they might be low in incoming ammonia or incoming TKN. Uh, you may also have zooglobal structures and excessive EPS slime formation. Um, high EPS production or slime may cause mild foaming, or it more typically causes slow settling flock. Uh, these types of flock might actually carry over into your secondary clarifier and increase your TSS. Um, if you have foaming filaments also present, sliming may make foaming worse. Um, that's because these flocks with a lot of slime are actually pretty weak in shear strength. So they also are very light and they tend to float. Um, and that's why you might see them carry over with foam or just with the water movement and increase your TSS. Oh, one more thing, adding more nitrogen in this situation um, doesn't cause many pro problems. In fact, once you add a little bit more nitrogen, the slime starts to thin out and you lose the zooglobal structures and everything tends to settle a little faster. Uh, nitrogen deficient bulking is, also can occur. Uh, when your incoming ammonia is too low. And this bulking is generally characterized by um, low influent ammonia, but high effluent ammonia, and a whole bunch of filaments. So the filament we most commonly see in this low ammonia, incoming ammonia situation is type 021N or thiothrix. 
This filament can thrive in aeration basins with low nitrogen. It's also somewhat resistant to chlorine, so chlorinating the return in this situation may make your bulking worse because it'll kill off your flock and break up your flock more, and these filaments will still be intact. Um, mixed liquors that we have seen with high populations of this filament uh, can sometimes form a thin scum on the surface, and it might make the mixed liquor seem slimy or stringy when you try to pipette it. Um, prolonged nitrogen deficiency, as I mentioned, can lead to cell death, and when the cells die, they release um, all their internal nutrients, and this might include more ammonia. So this is why you see an increase in effluent ammonia when you have bulking or foaming in your aeration basin. Um, nitrifiers might actually still be present in both situations, but they'll be dormant because they've got no food and, or they've got no ammonia or nitrite to generate energy, so they've got nothing to do, and they'll just be sitting there. So in summary, um, you must have good BOD removal before nitrification can occur. If your heterotrophs are not working efficiently and you run into problems with mixed liquor and sludge age, your nitrifiers won't function. Uh, they may be dormant if they are present, but they also might just get washed out of the system. Um, some conditions will also make it difficult to reestablish a large working population of nitrifiers. Uh, that's why I generally stress that you first need to get good BOD removal um, before we can try to do anything else to increase nitrification in a wastewater treatment plant. Um, it's also difficult to populate nitrifiers when it's due to factors you can't control, so the typical situations will be temperature fluctuations. Um, mostly this occurs in winter to spring when you go from maybe the negatives, uh, negative 10 Fahrenheit to jump to another day of 40 degree Fahrenheit and then back and forth for several days. Um, also washouts may occur at these times with just sudden ice melt and a fast flow rate. Uh, in this situation, Vitastim Dynamic Duo can help to repopulate the nitrifiers, um, but only once the conditions have passed and things have stabilized for at least a few days. Um, nitrification or nitrogen deficiency may also make it look like you have lost nitrification due to higher effluent ammonia levels. However, you, you might actually be running on too little nitrogen. Um, in this case, adding nitrifiers does not help, but actually adding a good nitrogen source does. So some common signs of nitrogen deficiency include effluent ammonia that is higher than your influent ammonia, the presence of bulking filaments such as type 021N or thiothrix, um, and possibly slimy looking uh, mixed liquor or flocks if you're looking at it under the microscope. Right, so that's all I had to say about our nitrification um, webinar. Here's a list of upcoming webinar events. And does anyone have any questions? Ah, here's a question that we have that says, what solutions do you have for nitrogen deficient wastewater treatment plants? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so first of all, we'd like to see what is, perhaps what else might be going on with your nitrogen deficient uh, wastewater plant. So is it in your incoming? What sort of incoming waste do you have normally? What sort of, um, do you have any other ways of increasing nitrogen into that waste? Um, so in general, what we have are a few different products. Um, one is called Accelerator 7. That's a very fast release nitro uh, ammonia source. Well, nitrogen source, it's not actually ammonia. Uh, the other thing we have is a slower release nitrogen source called filament buster. That also helps a lot, um, particularly if you're getting bulking from nitrogen deficiency. All right. Well, thank you, Deborah, and thank you all for being here. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at the next uh, wastewater webinar. Thank you.